right now. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to make it. So when I say make it, I'm talking about the neurotransmitter. And here I have foods and your mood. So we learned about lots of different neurotransmitters. Let's talk about um, where we get where we get the uh, neurotransmitter from is from our diet. Okay. So we get our neurotransmitters from our diet. So for example, what do you what do you consider the um, brain food? A lot of people tell me fish. Okay. Well, what fish has in it is it has the omega threes, which are the fatty acids, which help you know the build the myelin sheath for in the brain. But also fish has choline in it. So anything that has choline in it, like fish, eggs, nuts. That helps to make more acetylcholine, which I think you might remember that acetylcholine is associated with memory, and deficits of acetylcholine is related to Alzheimer's disease. So when you're eating fish and things that have choline in it, that seems to help build the acetylcholine. So then I ask you, okay, let's think of another one. Um, have you heard that you should have cookies and milk before you go to bed? The reason why that might help you go to sleep, like the carbs, like do you notice that when you eat carbohydrates that you feel they give you kind of a relaxed state, um, kind of you don't feel when you eat a big heavy carb dinner like pasta or a big turkey dinner where you had turkey and stuffing, they have something, turkey has tryptophan in it. But the thing is, is that you need the carbohydrates to help the brain um, absorb the tryptophan. So when you eat carbs, um, like carbs with milk, milk has tryptophan in it, a glass of warm milk and cookies, the carbohydrates will help the tryptophan from the milk get up to the brain, which would increase the levels of serotonin, which would help you go to sleep. So you get tryptophan from um, turkey, I think a lot of you have heard of that, and also warm milk. Now, let's stereotype. Let's stereotype the um, meat eaters and the vegetarians. I know this is terrible to stereotype, but let's just try it. Okay, so when you think of a vegetarian, like what type of person do you think of? Do you usually think of like a really aggressive person or do you kind of think of someone like, oh, let's hug the trees, let's all love one another? right okay so what but then when you stereotype like a real meat and potatoes person you kind of think of them as more aggressive I'm gonna fight till the end type of person is actually when you eat red meats um, it has tyrosine in it so the tyrosine actually makes more of the catecholamines and so um, Actually, they recommend that, like, let's say um, I have a downtime in the afternoon. I like to get up really early in the morning, but then from about 2 to 4, I'm kind of tired, kind of just not not as mentally stimulated during that time of day. It's hard for me in meetings and things. But let's say that I really had to stay awake for a meeting to really pay attention is it would be better for me not to eat any carbs for lunch. What I should eat is some salad and some meat because the salad and the meat would be more likely just to make the catecholamines, which is your dopamine, your epinephrine, norepinephrine. Whereas if I ate a big carbohydrate meal, I'm going to have that down slump, which could be more the tryptophan. So um, when you eat red meat, I don't know how some of you might feel very energized by it again because you're releasing the it, it makes it helps to build the the catecholamines um i talked about uh your um the chili peppers the chili peppers release something called capacin which actually burns your mouth and then will f release the endorphins but let's talk about something that seems to release endorphins is sugar so someone who's coming off of heroin, heroin is working on the endorphins, is they will want massive, massive amounts of sugar because when you eat sugar, it releases the endorphins. So um, 
a lot of you will say, gosh, I just need some sugar just so I can relax, or a meal doesn't feel finished to me because I just need that sugar just to feel calm, f to feel relaxed. I know some of you know about the sugar high, too, but what it's what it, what the sugar releases is the sugar releases heroin. I mean, I'm sorry, not heroin. I take that back. Oh, my goodness. It releases the endorphins. So kind of when you're getting that, um, when you say, I, gosh, I want that sugar high, it's, well, the sugar can give energy and things, but also it just makes you feel more calm and things like that, okay? So um, there's some people that believe that just by changing your diet that it can absolutely affect your mood. And so um, there's books out that are kind of like, a, there's one called Dr. Newbold's Nutrition for Nerves. And he said that he's found ways to cure schizophrenia just by changing a person's diet, taking out things that uh, seem to make the brain uh, kind of allergic, react, releasing different neurotransmitters by changing their diet. There's other books called um, Foods for Your Mood and Potatoes, Not Prozac, you know, talking about, you know, just change up what you're eating and things and that will affect your mood. So it's something that you might want to consider to, you know, how, how much could you uh, manipulate your mood by changing your diet. Um, also, diet sodas have, uh, if you look on the side of the diet soda, it says phenylethylalanine. And so phenylethylalanine is um, related to dopamine. So w a lot of people, uh, they get like a, a sense of pleasure from releasing the phenylethylalanine. Also chocolate has the phenylethylalanine, which I think a lot of you know that chocolate across the world is known as one of the most coveted foods there are. There's quite a few different chemicals the sugar in chocolate makes releases the endorphins and then the phenylethylalanine and the theobromine seem to help to release the dopamine and so when you have the dopamine oh I feel good mixed with kind of the endorphins um, which is I feel good but I feel also mellow and at one with the universe that f that that produces a very um, a very nice state where you feel this sense of feeling alive and feel a sense of well-being Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so step number one was synthesis of the neurotransmitters. So I put that in terms of you have to make it. And what you should know is that you make the neurotransmitter from your diet. But then the next thing that you have to do is where the neurotransmitters are made is some of them are made in the cell body and some of them are made in the vesicles is you have to transport it. So, okay, let's draw our neuron again. Okay. So the simple neurotransmitters like dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine, they're made down here. Inside right here, there's some vesicles. I probably have a video that I can show you of this, okay? So in here, there's storehouses called vesicles, and this stores the neurotransmitters because we know that the action potential goes down the axon, and then the neurotransmitter is released. That was the whole point of the action potential, so then the neurotransmitter is released. So... But if you remember, we had some really complex neurotransmitters, which were the endorphins and the substance P. And then the GABA and the glutamate were more complex, but not quite as complex as the peptides. So peptides have to be made right here in the cell body. The simple neurotransmitters are made down here at, the, at this. So the second step that has to happen at the synapse is the complex neurotransmitters. They have to be transported down to the vesicles. Okay, then what we have to do is we have to release the neurotransmitter. So how do we release a neurotransmitter? We release it through an action potential. Okay, action potential. Um, before I do this, is the way that I go over this in my, in my class, face-to-face, -face, is I drink um, sodas, like Diet Cokes, all the time. I tend to need the caffeine. And um, I don't know, maybe I'm addicted to the phenylethylamine, something.
but I drink them all the time in class. It's kind of my crutch, and I just like them. So since I have one in class every day, is I tell them, look, the six steps of Synapse is we're going to look at it like everybody knows that I use this drug, the caffeine that's in the Diet Coke. Okay, so I do it this way as I say, okay, in order for me to get the effects of the caffeine, what's the first thing that has to be done for me to get this? Okay, and so we establish that first of all, the Coke has to be made. And how do you make Coke? You make Coke from things that are in our environment, so on and so forth. Okay, but then after they make the Coke, it has to be transported to the store. So now we have to bring this transmitted to the store then what has to happen is is in order for me to get the effects of the coke is the the store has to release the neurotransmitter to me okay the ca the diet coke to me so i would enter the store to get it so what happens is is we need to have an action potential so the action potential travels down the length of the cell and then the calcium enters there's calcium outside here and it enters here and the calcium entering will push the neurotransmitters out of the vesicles so now the next question is okay how much does it push it pushes them in small packets called quantums. Um, it, if it releases a neurotransmitter, it releases this amount of neurotransmitter pretty much stably. Now, the people say, can it release more than one neurotransmitter? Yes. Each neuron can release a certain number of neurotransmitters. So let's say that this particular neuron can release dopamine, epinephrine, and serotonin. The thing is, is that the neuron cannot choose what neurotransmitter to release. If it releases dopamine, epinephrine, and serotonin, then it will always release dopamine, epinephrine, and serotonin. So every time it releases a neurotransmitter, it's going to release the same three. It can't say, oh, I'm going to release dopamine at this point, and oh, I'm going to release serotonin at this point. Is if it releases those three, it's always going to release those three. Okay, um, so uh, the answer is, is that it can release, a neuron can release more than one neurotransmitter, but it cannot pick and choose the neurotransmitters. Okay, let's go to the next one. So now I've got my Diet Coke. And maybe I bought Diet Coke, Diet Mountain Dew, and Diet Sunkist. Maybe I bought all three of those. Okay. So every t if I was making this analogous to the nervous system, then if those are the ones that that store gave me, then it would always have to give me those three. I can't just pick and choose. But now, in order for me to get the effects of the caffeine, the caffeine has to attach to me, so I would have to drink it. So the store has given me the Coke, but now I have to drink it. So if you guys have ever seen this little toy that kids have, um, you put the shapes in the box, you know, like this. Have you seen this? is the outside of a neuron membrane kind of looks like this is it's got all these different shapes all these receptors so the presynaptic neuron so here's the axon right right and then down here would be the you know see me draw this a million times okay so down here this releases its neurotransmitters okay well first the neurotransmitter is restored in the vesicles. Then we had an action potential, action potential, and then the calcium entered the cell. It pushed these neurotransmitters out. The neurotransmitters crossed the synapse because this is the space between. Okay, right, the synapse, and then they go to the next neuron. So there's another neuron right here. Okay. And so on the outside of these dendrites, there's all these little shapes. So when the neurotransmitter goes across, it acts like a key to stimulate this. So let's say that the circle is dopamine. 
Okay, so that if this neur neuron right here releases dopamine, then it will go and attach to the dopamine receptor. If it releases, say, let's say the triangle is serotonin, if it releases serotonin, then the serotonin will attach to the triangular shape. So think of it like a key, okay? But then I do this in classes like, uh, and my school keys is I have this key that can open up any classroom up and down the hallway. But if I open up a classroom, the 101 classroom, it's this great big multimedia classroom. That's where I usually teach. And it's got the two screens. We use the PowerPoint. And that's your lecture class. But I can take that same key and use it downstairs in this room for Psych 43. And Psych 43 is this class where you sit around in group and you talk about your feelings. Okay, so if I use this key to open up this room, then we have a lecture type class. But if I use the same exact key to open up this room downstairs, then we're going to have a group class. So that's something for you to know is that serotonin is the key, but serotonin can open up different locks. And if it opens up this receptor lock, then you get this experience. But if it opens up this receptor lock, then you get a different different experience. So an, another question would be, um, can, a neuro, can a neuron respond to or release more neurotransmitters? Can it release more or respond to more? And the answer is it can respond to more neurotransmitters. All up and down this, this uh, you know, the outside membrane, there, it could have so many different receptors, all kinds of different receptors with slightly different nuances, and it can respond to all of those. But a neuron only releases very few neurotransmitters, so maybe the most I think that they found that a neuron can release is six, but it could respond to 30 different neurotransmitters. Okay, so now let's get to this. Is I told you before that a neuron, uh, that a neurotransmitter can only have two types of effects, an inhibitory or an excitatory. So this is true. A neurotransmitter can only give an excitatory effect or an inhibitory effect. But now we have to add this down. It could be an inhibitory ionotropic or an excitatory ionotropic, or it could be an inhibitory metabotropic or an excitatory metabotropic. So let's talk about this. An ionotropic effect is just a very simple effect. It opens or closes ionic gates. So basically, let's see if you guys can remember this from chapter two, is if I had an inhibitory ionotropic effect, what gate would be opened? Would it be the sodium gate or would it be the potassium gate? Okay, it would be potassium because that would put the cell into a state of inhibition, a hyperpolarization. So it would allow the, the potassium to just go out of the cell freely, freely, freely. Okay, right? But if I had an excitatory ionotropic effect, what gate would be open or closed there? it would be sodium gate would be open. So an ionotropic effect would be the sodium gate opens, which allows the sodium to rush in, which would be a depolarization. depolarization. Okay? So ionotropic effects are short, they're fast and short. They just, when the neurotransmitter attaches to the receptor on the membrane, it just opens or closes a gate. But now we also have to have another type of effect, one that is slow and long. So right now I want you to think of um, something that's really good to you, like maybe a steak, a rare steak, or, or maybe a well-done steak, steak, potatoes, like a really good dinner. Or maybe you're a sweets person and I want you to envision a chocolate cake. Okay, so once you've envisioned a really good meal, probably if you truly envisioned it, probably what happened was your, um, your, uh, you probably developed some saliva in your mouth. 
So that happened so fast, that was an ionotropic effect. But now that you stopped thinking about it, there's no more saliva in your mouth. And that would be ionotropic too. But what if you were truly eating that cake? Would you need lots of saliva in your mouth? Yes, you would. And so what you need is you need two types of effects. You need something that makes it happen really fast, but then you need something that makes the saliva continue. So we have this other type of effect that neurotransmitters can have. It's metabotropic. So in a metabotropic effect, let's say uh, this is dopamine. It attaches to this dopamine receptor, and then what it does is the dopamine um, sends a message to the inside of the cell and it uses a second, second messenger system. It gives a message to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP, it goes around throughout the cell and changes the way the cell reacts. So instead of the cell needing a depolarization, a quick depolarization, it's just kind of making the saliva release be continuous. So this, the, a metabotropic effect is, absolute, is changing the way the cell is reacting, and it uses a second messenger system. Um, you can read more about that in the book, but basically what I want you to know is that ionotropic is a fast and short and it's opening the gates. Metabotropic is slow and long, and it's making changes to the cell. Now, these changes can go back to what they were before the action potential was on them, but these changes are going to be semi-permanent, I mean, not semi-permanent, but they're going to be long-lasting. They're going to stay there for a while so that you can have something last for a while. Okay, now, okay, so now let's go back to my Coke analogy. So first we made the Coke, okay, they used chemicals in the environment to make the Coke, then they transported it to the store, then the store released the Coke to me, but then I drank the Coke, it attached to my receptor, so now I feel good. Oh, I feel great, I've got some more energy, but now what is my body going to do with it, okay? Well, um, basically probably what's going to happen is, is now my body is going to break it down into inactive components. So let's, let's show you how this works. Okay, so here's the neuron. Okay, so this is going to be the presynaptic. Okay, here's another neuron. And we're going to call this the postsynaptic. Oh, it's hard to write with this. Okay. Uh, okay. So this one, the neurotransmitter was made. It was stored in the vesicles. It was released into the synapse. Okay. Released into the synapse. The calcium entered the cell. The neurotransmitter went across here to attach to its receptor sites, but now we don't want to leave it in the synapse because if you leave the neurotransmitter in the synapse, it keeps knocking. So a neurotransmitter, it doesn't have a mind of its own. It's just it knows that it goes and attaches to the receptor site. It goes and it, so you don't want it to attach and then attach again and then attach again and then attach again. You want it to go, attach, open the door, or do whatever it's going to do and then be taken then get rid of it, inactivate it. So some neurotransmitters are reuptaken. So it goes and attaches, and then this one pulls it back, and it's drawn back into the cell that sent it. So a really gross um, analogy would be, you know how people bend over and they spit, and then they draw it back in, spit, draw it back in, spit, draw it back in. That would be like reuptake. The initial cell that released it, it's drawn back into the presynaptic cell and used again. So that's why the simple ones are like that. But then some of them aren't drawn back into the cell. Like, for example, um, sometimes they're broken down. So I think of like street sweeping trucks 
they come along and they are in the synapse and they just take this and they break it down. For example, acetylcholinesterase, okay, that is going to break down acetylcholine. So what it does is it breaks down it into acetate and choline. So then the choline gets brought back to the cell, is broken down, it goes through the blood, and the choline is going to serve to make more acetylcholine. Then the acetate is probably just going to be uh, removed from the body. Just get rid of that. Okay. Um, so you've got different components that will break down um, the neurotransmitters once they're in the synapse, like COMT and MAOs and monoamine oxidase and acetylcholinesterase. So for example, just to show you how this would work is um, there used to be this antidepressant that was fairly common. It was called MAOIs, mono amine oxidase inhibitors is C by keeping um, monoamine oxidase, that would be serotonin, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, by keeping that in the synapse so they're not broken down, then that would raise the levels of the serotonin, that dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine. So it gave them a mood boost because they couldn't be broken down. Basically what cocaine does is you release the dopamine and then the dopamine is supposed to be drawn back into the cell that released it. But what cocaine does is cocaine blocks the reuptake of dopamine right here. So instead of dopamine just going like this, basically by taking cocaine is it leaves the dopamine in the synapse and so you don't just get this, you get this. So that gives you a much bigger high than what you're nor what you're used to. Okay, let's see what we have on this next slide, but I think we are finished with this part. Yes. Okay, so let's go back and review. Okay? The six steps at the synapse. Let's just make it look really tight. Okay? First we gotta make it. Then we gotta get it to the storehouse, which are the vesicles. Then we've gotta get it released. And you get it released by an action potential and the calcium enters the cell. Then it travels across the synapse, it attaches to the postsynaptic receptor sites, it turns the lock either with an ionotropic or a metabotropic effect, and then we have to get it out of the synapse by either reuptake or taking it back in. So for example, with the key analogy is I use the key, I turn the lock, and then I take the key out and I put it into my pocket. But if I was using the key analogy with breakdown, I put the key in, I turn the lock, but then something comes along and just disintegrates that key. It just disintegrates it all together. Okay? So make it, transport it, release it, attach, reuptake, or breakdown. It's not too hard, actually. It's pretty